Hello, welcome again to my podcast and to my YouTube channel. We Today, I have Joanna Grace with me. She was sent, I have talked about the Stability Network before, but I want to emphasize again the wonderful work that they do. And they have been sending me wonderful guests. They talk about mental health and that's actually what they do. They get, to, they get all these people together, they train them. And what they do is they open up this dialogue about mental health and their struggles. Some of them struggled with suicidal ideation. Some of them lost people to suicide, loved ones. And today we're going to talk to Joanna. Joanna, thank you so much for saying yes and for being here with us. Welcome to the podcast and the YouTube channel. Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity. Well, it's, it's my great opportunity to talk to you. I have to say that you are the first person I interview who lost both parents to suicide. I am so sorry. I was so, you know, I, I've, I'm used to listening to stories and to talking to people and all this experience. I lost my dad to suicide, but I had never talked to someone who lost both parents. And how, how old were you when that happened? I was in my thirties. Mm -hmm. um, so it was 1997 mm -hmm. and I would have to do some really quick math. <laughs> so I basically, I was 35 you when 35 years it happened. Old. Yes. Well, and that was, was it seven years after your brother died? Was that it? My brother died in 1970 oh, and my parents okay. died by suicide in 1997. Oh, so okay. basically so almost 30 years. Almost 30 years. Mm -hmm. Wow. What, you know, uh, the, one, the one thing I was thinking about when I read your story, because I usually, just so the listener knows, I usually ask my guests to write like a page with their story, a page or two, so just so I have some background. And I was, I was wondering, wow, so you were 30-something years old. You, you lost your brother. You lost both your parents to suicide. That is so much to go through. And also, and that's part of the stability network and in, in what they do, you also struggled with mental illness since your teens, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh so when my brother died, it was a tragedy in that he fell from a third story porch. And so that alone, now we know about ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. Yes. We had none of that in 1970. So mm -hmm. when he died in July of 1970, he would have been seven years old that August oh, of 1970. Goodness. And then to add on top of that, we were moving to a whole new part of Chicago where I was born and raised. And I mm -hmm. started a new school and he was my best friend. We were both went to school together. We traveled to school. We walked to school together every single day. So it was just a, a great big loss for me. Mm -hmm. And what I watched over the next almost 30 years was my parents grieving, although they were doing their best to raise their three children to adulthood yeah. and, and even welcome their grandchildren into the world. So I, I've been able to look at their lives as more of a, um, a way to think about strength and courage and focus. Mm -hmm. and being able to make sure that you're doing the right thing for your children. But of course, what also happened when my brother died, they didn't have access to any kind of grief counseling. Mm -hmm. uh, there was just Back nothing. then, yeah, so yeah. yeah. It was, it was, was very really rare, done. right. And so, and then also being African-American, we just either did not have access or were not really in favor of getting that kind of counseling. So they struggled, but we moved forward as a family and achieved a lot of milestones, fortunately, that helped us, I think, balance out some of the grief. But when they actually died by suicide, that's when I realized, I, I told people, I said, because I'm the oldest of four, mm -hmm. I told people, I said, you know, they were grieving all this time. And people yes. kind of in my family said, what do you mean? I said, you know, I watched them and different things that they would do. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm sure in retrospect, you can look at these things, but, you know, at the time in you said they were grieving and that's what people say what to right because we have mm -hmm. the idea that grieving has a time a preset time after a few days a few months or a couple of years that's gone 
And it's not, right. it's, a, it's a lifelong process. We know that, right? And I'm sure you experienced right. that yourself. We know that now. And I think the what we know now, it will help us do much better with people because people really need someone who can listen during that time period. And what you just said about, we think grief is somehow just a certain time period or it's abbreviated. It shows up all the time. You just never mm -hmm. know. Like I, from my own experience of my brother and then my parents, it, it just, it can show up. You can be happy. And then yeah. there'll be a memory of some something that you did that was happy with your brother or your parents in my case. And that good memory can trigger a bad memory. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I had to understand that and understand how mm -hmm. um, the pain and the hurt and the harm and the suffering didn't mean that I always have to be that way, but I definitely needed to learn how to work through it because that was one of my biggest issues. I use, as I write about, um, busyness as a way of coping with my grief. And that's what I watch my parents do, especially my mm, father. You did, that's what they yes. did. They worked and yeah. Yes. They made, they made sure they had no distractions, just right. work, right. work, my, work. My father especially was a workaholic, type A personality. My mother was the kind of person where she just could enjoy life because she focused on the children. So she mm -hmm. had a, a different way of grieving and her way was to buy us things sometimes or to mm -hmm. make special foods. Um, she loved to laugh. And I, when I think about her, that's what I really remember the most about her. And she was kind of a kid at heart because she would play childhood games with us like jacks and jump rope. Mm -hmm. uh, she would you know, just always want to do something fun with us. And, and that was her way of taking our mind off the grief. Mm -hmm. And for me, with my siblings, I'm three years older than my sister and 12 years older than my brother, my second brother. So they weren't having the same experience that I was having with grief because they had not witnessed the actual fall from the porch. I did. You and did? You saw? Yes. Oh, my God. Right. Joanna. So my brother and I were just about a year and a half apart. So we were just very, very close. We were raised to just wow. be close. So that's what created, I, for me, the inability to understand grief mm -hmm. because I'm a child. And yeah. prior to uh, 1970 and 1968, my closest encounter with grief and, and dying was when Dr. Martin Luther King was assassinated. That was my really my first look at what it meant to grieve. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. I also witnessed a great deal of anger during that time period because there were riots that broke yes. out. Yeah, it, it's it, a very it turbulent time. Yes. And at that time period, when they finally we were able to go back to school, my brother and I, we were walking past embers from dying from from the fires that were dying out. Because wow. you know, you hose different buildings, put you put the water on the different buildings, but there's still embers that's there. And I just remember this feeling of what, what's happened to my neighborhood? What What's going on here? So I, sometimes I think um, we might give too much responsibility to children to understand what's mm -hmm. going on. Because I think about some of the serious issues that we have had recently uh, with the murder of Michael Brown, for example. Yes. Yeah. And kids, as soon as I found out that kids were staying at home, I, it immediately took me to a place of, Oh my God, you know, how are these kids going to be able to cope? How are they, how are they going to understand what's mm -hmm. going on? Because adults are running around trying to get things in place, but and sometimes children are just observing all of this behavior, yes. not really being able to process it in a way that is meaningful for them. So now mm -hmm. we're, we're witnessing the rates of suicide climbing for African-American youth is twice the rate of white European youth. And so now we're struggling with what, what's going on here? What's this data all about? How, how do we make sense of, there could be cultural differences, for example, because uh, generally uh, speaking, the differences between African-Americans and whites, uh, even having access to therapy or being willing to go to therapy is, is, yes. has been different. Yes, yes, and, and that's, you know, we, we had this discussion when I was having, going to, going to school in my program at, George Fox University, they give a lot of weight to, to social equality and things like that. And we talk, and I remember the teachers mentioning that there is resistance within the African-American uh, communities to go to therapy. And for obvious reasons, I actually listened to you talk about this, 
how you had a therapist who didn't ask the questions, who was not really open-minded about treating you and how hard it was for you until you found someone because of course, of course you're resistant, right? And one of the things that I think I heard you talk about, no, no, it was just something that I was thinking that during the program, we talked a lot about this. And you have, for example, a client that comes in and she's been or he's been a victim of sexual abuse and you ask about it, but you don't ask an African-American about racism. I mean, how is that for you? Or even I, I have a client who is African-American and I remember talking to her and at the, one of the first questions I asked her, how, how does it feel to have a white uh, therapist for you? Does that make a difference? I mean, what can, you know, what can I do? Uh, to make this, um, you know, really therapeutic for you? Is there anything I shouldn't do? So I ask the questions, but usually we don't. And the, the question in that is, well, maybe I was not a victim of, of sexual abuse and I will ask about it. Why won't you ask about racism, right? And their experience mm -hmm. with that. And, and I heard you talk about this and I'm, I'm sure that it, it's a good reason why they, they don't search for, for therapy, right? Well, that um, video was through Psych Hub, and mm -hmm. it's used in the curriculum for diversity and mental health okay. because they have mm -hmm. a mental health ally certification process that you can go through. They're democratizing access to mental health resources so that people on the ground can also be a part of the solution. Mm -hmm. So my experience with representation first happened when I was a teenager going through depression. So my family really didn't know what to do. And my dad was the one who took me to the hospital, not the hospital, excuse me, but to the office, my uh, pediatrician. And then the next doctor over that said, well, we'll get her a therapist and we'll have her talk to someone. Mm -hmm. But my ability to relate to this person was very tough because she looked at me differently. And because I grew up in a city where there was a lot of racism, overt, covert racism mm -hmm. in the city of Chicago, which has a you know very long history of racism, we just were not on the same page. And I remember letting my parents know, I don't wanna go back to her. The doctor had prescribed some medication and I also talk about this, but my mom had an experience with her oldest sister being diagnosed with a mental illness and taking medication which basically kept her, for lack of a better way to put it, doped up. That's what the family yeah. experienced. So my mother, basically, her thing was, I'm not going to give my daughter this medication. And she's of a course, teenager. Yeah. And I don't know what can happen with her on this medication. So my mother, my mother's whole thing was that she loved me. She would love me through this mm -hmm. latest episode of uh, my just tuning out. And th that was my grief expressing itself. That's how I dealt with things. I would just basically just go within and not really have any contact with the world. But saved me though, always was school because I mm -hmm. loved going to school. I, I, I mean, I, I couldn't stand to miss school. So when I would have these episodes and the teachers would be making sure I had my homework and everything, my main thing with my mother is when can I go back to school? My mother of would course. say, okay, you know, we're, we're gonna wait until you can do this, this, and this, and you're eating okay, you're sleeping okay, then you can go back to school. So she gave me goals to reach for that helped mm -hmm. me get through the depression. And I, when I think about her, I also, I also think about how could this woman be dealing with her own grief, then have a child, yes. another child who's dealing with, the, you know, what became known as a mental illness. How, how was she managing all of this? That was, you know, how I always thought about her. I'm like, she's incredible. So. I just um, admire my mother so much for her strength and her courage and her ability to stay focused on her role as a mother. Mm -hmm. What I can only imagine what would have happened had she not had a certain amount of sensitivity to me. When I became an adult, she actually was diagnosed with bipolar disorder. Oh. So then I'm managing that as well as the oldest of the siblings. Um, and I had recently had my first child. So when I think about my life, I'm 59 years old now, I think about just the, the, there's a lot of highs and there's some lows and then there's finally some middle where things seem normal. You know, that whole mm -hmm. thing about being, having my own two children also helped me understand what my parents had been through 
and um, how I would feel if I ever lost one of my children. And I know people who have lost children, for example, and, and that's a hole in your heart. Oh my and I remember my daughter yeah. saying to me, because she was going to turn nine years old the year that November that my parents died by suicide. And she said, when I got the phone call about my mother and I practically collapsed on the floor and she, my daughter, she's so sweet. And she said, mommy, she will always be in your heart. And that's what I took away the most from all of this is that even wow. though people are physically gone, spiritually, they're still with you. Mm -hmm. And that's yeah. what helped me get through some things also when I had my own issues with suicide and thought I didn't want to be here anymore. My own experience mm -hmm. has been that you're literally exhausted by the time you get to that point. You, you're not even able to think through what you might normally be able to think through if you weren't experiencing the ideation. So my parents were literally seven days apart when they died by suicide. Wow. So I ended up burying both my parents in 14 days, literally like, so for a long time, I couldn't even process that. I couldn't remember their birth dates. I couldn't remember their marriage date. I couldn't remember when they actually had passed on, when their burials were. I had to, that was my way of surviving, of getting through things. I know that now, um, so that I could continue to be a mother to my two children, continue to stay focused on them and what they needed as children. So my experience has been one of making sure I'm getting an understanding on my story, making sure that I get it before I can really share it with other people. Because I think sometimes um, stories, if we're not careful, and I've been very careful when I'm talking about my why, can become misrepresented as it's just a story of tragedy. And it's very important to balance that tragedy out with the hope that's also on the other side of this. Um, because when I do have my moments when I'm feeling down, I'm kind of like, well, um, what can I think about that will help me feel happy again? Mm -hmm. And when I can get myself in that place, it's, it's a lot of work taking care of yourself, it, wellness, self-care. And you have to be able to tell your story in a way that is representative of that process, that journey. Yeah, I love that you say that. And also that you mentioned, I read um, one of the things you wrote to me was that you, you, you also learn from resilience and that's what you learn from your parents. It's kind of a choice too. As you said, it, do I reframe what happened in my life? Or do I just follow this, this line of tragedy, as you said, right? And, and at some point, and I don't, I don't know, I would love to hear you, what point in your life that was that you made a decision to, to take care of yourself. And, and you mentioned self-care and you said, well, I, it's your responsibility too, right? It's my responsibility to make choices and to decide that I need to take care of myself. One of, one of the things you also mentioned was that when you were pregnant, you stopped taking medication because you didn't want to affect your daughter, right? Faith, is that her yes, name? Yes, Faith. Yes. Mm -hmm. So what is your son's name? Jonathan. Jonathan, okay. And so these are things, I'm sure it wasn't easy for you to stop medication, but these are, these are choices too, right? You, you are responsible to, and I think it's, it's important that we know that. You know, if you have mental illness, yes, there is an element, of course, depending on how, how badly affected you are. And, and as you know, mental illness goes up and down, there are cycles but sometimes you feel immobilized, but there is, there is an element of choice. And that's great because it's empowering to think, to think that only medication and other people and in situation external, ex, external factors will be responsible is very disempowering. And I think the most important thing that I had to learn about medication was that it was imperative. I need to take my medication, but mm -hmm. I also need to be very clear with the psychiatrist because they're the ones who's prescribing it. Um, I need to be very clear about how the medication is impacting me because what I learned was that the general dosage was sometimes too much for me mm -hmm. to metabolize. So just having these discussions with the psychiatrist turned out to be a huge factor in my well-being because I had to advocate 
for myself. And then when my family would get involved, now that my two children are basically adults, they get involved more now. We have to basically make sure that we're not just um, falling into a trap of, here, take this prescription, you'll feel better in the morning kind of thing. It's an ongoing process learning what medications will work for you, um, what the dosage needs to be. You need to understand that psychiatrist, are you going to have a relationship that's collaborative so that you're both adding to this um, therapeutic relationship so that you can get better. And then there's a huge factor in being stable. How, what are the ingredients that will help me be stable? I was in a program for a while where I had to create a wellness plan. And that was my first time actually writing out on paper what was working, what wasn't working, and what was on my wish list. So for example, if I wanted a, um, a banana split, I just, just happened the other day, actually. I was just talking about it. I, said, I love banana splits. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> so finally, I was like, okay, just stop feeling guilty about it. You haven't even had one yet. Yes, you're feeling all this guilt about it. Just go and get it. And immediately, I was satisfied. As soon as I ate, I was like, okay, that's enough for a banana split. But it's just knowing those things about yourself. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's understanding what makes you tick. And I think for those of us who, because I always tell, tell people, I have bipolar disorder. I will, I never say I am bipolar disorder because that's not who I am. I'm I, I label myself in other ways, but not strictly in terms of I am bipolar. So I think that that ownership, that responsibility comes in when we start to take charge of the process of maintaining mm -hmm. our health. And it's just like if you know that, for example, I recently learned that I actually do need about 10 hours of sleep, which is really hard for me because I was emulating my father. I was type A workaholic. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden I had to learn and just like, you're either gonna start getting more sleep or you're gonna subject yourself to potentially more relapses. That's mm -hmm. because sleep is a huge factor oh, in yes. mental health. Whether you've been diagnosed with mental illness or not, you still <laughs> need sleep. And unfortunately, we live in a society where everything's so rushed all the time and people are going from one thing to another without even really thinking about what yeah. they're doing. Yeah. So that's another thing I think is we start to, as a society, get closer to what does it mean to, to thrive, to be resilient, to be able to cope with adversity. Once we start asking those questions, we'll get closer to creating something that is, is works well for all of us. It'll be more flexible. It won't be as institutionalized um, where we have to like literally go to the psych ward in order to get help. There will mm -hmm. be yeah. opportunity before then to get help and, and not just have to be hospitalized, for example. Yeah, yeah. And I love that you mentioned this. I interviewed um, a few weeks ago, Jess. Her name is Jess Fritz. And just so the listeners know if they want to listen to that episode. And we, uh, the focus of the interview was this, taking charge of your, of your treatment and your health. Because she, as you said, sometimes we think that we'll go to a doctor, we'll go to a psychiatrist or a nurse practitioner here. They will tell you what to take, how much of it to take, and that's it. And what so many times happens is you come back, you take the medication, it starts to make you sick. You feel all the, all, the, all the side effects from the medication, which doesn't mean the medication is not doing its work. Sometimes it's just that you need and maybe either change the medication or just tweak it or lower the dosage or whatever it, it's needed. But that's not what we think. We, are, we, are, uh, we get these messages from society that that's what you do. You go to the doctor and you follow their orders. And that's not how it works, especially with mental illness. I mean, I've been treated for depression. It worked. I was very lucky that the dose worked, the medication worked. But many, many, that's not the, my sister. She's always changing medication. She, she knows, she pays attention. As you said, you have to know yourself. Pay attention. Is it working or not? Also take charge and advocate for yourself. If it's not working, your doctor doesn't want to, to hear you, change doctors, right? Now that kind of power, I think comes through experience. And we were talking about racism earlier. My experience being in the system, 
technically since 1987, because that was the first time I was diagnosed and I actually took the medication and then started mm -hmm. going through all the different things connected to the side effects of weight gain, mm -hmm. uh, uh, just having, um, being treated for bipolar disorder, the depression, but then the mania mm -hmm. tiptoed in. So I had to yeah. deal with that. So then there are other medications that are added on. But racism has an impact because if you're sitting in the chair and just opposite a white male physician, for example, the psychiatrist, mm -hmm. he may not be relating to you on a number of different levels. And I found that as a woman, as an African-American, it can be because of class. What I had to learn in the process was that, yes, I had the power to reject this psychiatrist because when I would share with most of them that my parents had died by suicide, what they would do is they would immediately say to me, oh, you're at high risk for suicide. Oh my goodness. And that's how I, they saw. Yes. I, I learned right away to not stay with that doctor because in my mind, I'm saying this, he, this doctor has a death sentence for me. Not one time have they said anything to me like, oh, do you have any hobbies? What about your friends? How are your children doing? They, they, they weren't concerned with all of me. They were just focused on this one part of me. So mm -hmm. in terms of representation, what I learned is that for me, what's best is when a person is able to relate to all of me. And I say that because my therapist right now is a white woman. The very way I started off is pretty much the way I'm going to end up. Like, because the main thing about this particular person is that she is not trying to fix me. That became clear early on. She's more concerned with this, this, this person called Joanna and not just with this bipolar disorder. She's not just, that's just a part of the whole thing. So we just had a session this past Monday and we're doing telehealth right now. And so when she's still taking notes, just like she would if we were sitting in her office and she's talking to me like a person. And recently I learned about cultural humility and that really resonated with me. I said, that's another missing ingredient in all of this is that we all have to learn to be more sensitive and respectful of each other because we do come from different cultures. So to kind of impose uh, like a standardized culture on everyone, like the white male culture on everyone, because this is my perspective. This is, these are the lenses which I operate from. That, that's gonna have to be one of the pivotal things that change. And fortunately we have a lot more representation happening because more and more African-Americans are being coached and mentored into choosing professions that will help them be a part of the, pro a part of the solution. And when we think about the people who are part of the problem, it's the ones who don't have that ability to, to step outside of a cultural norm and start to open up to this experience of having bipolar disorder. There's that. So there's maybe a textbook example of that. But there's a broader experience of living in this world as a person with a bipolar disorder. Just going to the disability network, we have been having more leaders join now who are from Africa, which mm -hmm. as a descendant of Africa, I'm drawn toward them and what they're, the work that they're doing, they're, they're very um, optimistic, which encourages me to understand that yeah. even mm -hmm. though I know that there's some issues around witchcraft and things like that in Africa when they deal with mental illness, mm -hmm. there are yeah. people who are establishing organizations, they're advocates and activists, and they're going to be moving the needle forward in terms yes. of just, and this happens all around the world. Yeah. And as you said, I mean, there's witchcraft, but again, that's a cultural mm -hmm. point, right? That's something that you have to take into consideration and, and have respect for because that's the culture, right? So you can't ignore that. Right. We can't ignore it. And we, I think the, the trick in all of this, Paul, is going to be us establishing that baseline for, for what can work and especially now with the youth because as a part of the work that I do my my work for my social enterprise 
building community capacity is the heart of it is youth. I'm a children's rights activist. So if we know that youth are experiencing more and more suicide, they're completing it. Yes. We have to start asking these questions because if a black male youth, an adolescent, because after my parents committed, died by suicide, I had to get my son a therapist. And the first thing I noticed was that he started messing up in school. Yes. And I knew that was a sign. I, that's, he's normally that's how they really, show through, through yes. behavior, right? He's normally really excited. He was really close to his grandparents, especially his grandfather. He was the first grandchild in the mail at that. So that put him on a certain amount of prestige right there. Well, I called the insurance company and I said to them, I need a black male therapist. And at first they said, oh, we don't organize the database that way. I said, yes, you do. I've worked with databases most of my career and I understand how coding is done. So I need a black male therapist. This is very serious. I explained to them what had happened with my parents and how my son needed help. So I, I got that. And it was amazing, his turnaround, just that he had someone that looked like him yeah. that could talk him through what was going on. So I know through my own personal and my professional experience, what works what's possible uh -huh. when you do the right things. And, and doctors, we're, we're come, we've come a long way with doctors, but we still have a ways to go because the problem is becoming bigger in the meantime. So we have to figure out how can we start to work together more and have more of a team atmosphere. Where I go right now for my mental health services, there's, it's a team-based leadership model. So everyone has a part in mm -hmm. Joanna's recovery and everyone's talking to each other. And actually the Affordable Care Act introduced us to a better way to connect all this information because there's a shared database now. Mm -hmm. And when I, I was sick for something else in back in May of last year, I didn't even know I had as many services as I have. It took my getting sick for me because I didn't need to them. Know. So, yeah. Yes, to find out. And so I'm saying to myself, you know, there's something um, miraculous and, and magical happening here where we're starting to figure it out, but yet we're still not quite in the, we're not quite in the center yet where people know about all these resources. Mm -hmm. And that's why I created my social enterprise. It's really about increasing access to information and resources, mm -hmm. especially for the indigenous population, because I've learned that's throughout so. my development career that people won't even know that something's right in their backyard mm -hmm. as a resource. Yes. So what we do with building community capacity is we connect and work with others with like-minded interests, mutual interests, and we start working on um, how do we get that access, first of all, so that people know about it, and then so that they're using it, they're engaged in it, and they're becoming empowered. Because mm -hmm. I found that once I became empowered, that's what helped me be able to help other people. Once I got a new, mo a new model for all the people right. too. Yes, I will make sure that I have the link to your social enterprise in the notes, because as you said, this is priceless. It's it's not that there are not resources, but we just don't know how to access them. Where, where are they? How can I find them? Right. right. So that's so needed. I'm so glad you do that. Joanna, I want to go back a little bit because you know my, um, my focus, of course, is suicide for those who are at risk and, and also families who lose uh, in your case, you lost your parents. And I want to talk and focus on your grief and, and the whole process, because as I said, I had never talked to someone who lost both parents to suicide. And I can't even begin to imagine how confusing and messed up that process was for you. It was, as you said, one week difference. First was your mom and then your dad. And I mean, can you, can you just walk me through? It's even hard to ask because it's just too much, too much to even think about. You weren't even, pro you were still in shock from the first loss and then you had the second in the same manner. And we know that suicide is different. It's, it's, a, it's just a different type of grief. T can you walk me through a little bit? I mean, what was happening? Well, how did, and, and you just mentioned now you had your son that you had to take care of because it was, it was really hard on him. So here you are as, as a daughter, grieving your parents, but as a mother, you had to take care of your son. So can, can you just tell me, I mean, about the emotions, what was going through your mind? Did you, did you shift gear to, I'm going to be even busier right now? 
or did you take some time to say, no, I have to feel this? I mean, what was it like for you? So when my brother died the way that he did, it was so sudden. Um, some of the things that I started to learn about his death happened when my mother was actually having a relapse with bipolar disorder. So I was starting to be, and I wasn't officially diagnosed with bipolar disorder the way that she was. And what I started to learn through going to her doctor's appointments was that her psychiatrist was uh, lacked a lot of empathy and compassion. She was very bossy, very mm -hmm. um, much like a dictator. You either take the medication or else. My mother loved the work that she was doing, but the psychiatrist would sometimes have to write it up and say, well, you can't go to work right now. So there was always this push and pull going on there. And then with my father, what I started to notice around the same time is that he was washing his hands all the time. Like he, mm -hmm. he loved uh, doing um, carpentry, for example. Mm -hmm. And I would just hear the sink, the water in the sink, bathroom sink going. And I would say, what is he doing in there washing his hands again? So what also was a part of this was that I physically moved away from Chicago and I mm -hmm. started just being in touch with my parents by phone. And when I would talk with my mother, my mother was, she was seriously considering getting a divorce from my father. And mm -hmm. she was always upset about something. So just dealing with my brother's death and the trauma associated with that, and then being the oldest child, which sometimes you end up kind of being put in a caretaker role for the other siblings, as well as the parents. By the time they had made their choice and my mother, she died first, then my father, I was a mother. So I'm looking at, actually by this time I had my both my children. My first reaction was I'm looking at these two children and I have to take care of them first and foremost. So Joanna has time to grieve when she has time to grieve, which may mean that she doesn't have time to grieve, right? Because I'm a mother of two pretty busy children. They're pretty active in sports and music and art and all these other kinds of things. So what I had to start doing was number one, remembering. And remembering has its own chores because when you start to remember things, you have to make sure that you're remembering them in a way that doesn't completely remove you from the family. And what I mean by that is my father would literally go in the bedroom and he would be crying. You could hear him sobbing, but he never allowed us to witness that. So by the time they committed, died by suicide, I was prepared in a way for my father because I remember telling my sister, my brother, I said, you know, I have to get back to where I'm living now. And I need you two to really watch over daddy because what can happen sometimes is that after one marital partner dies by suicide, the other one can. There's a whole another story associated with my siblings and their behavior during this time period. Mm -hmm. But when I got the phone call that my father had passed on, I almost kind of just knew that it was coming. So I was not prepared at all for my mother, but I was somewhat prepared for my father. So in terms of the busyness, the busyness came as a result of my needing to make sense out of things. And for me, making sense of it meant that I had to still be a good mother. I had to still make sure there was, there was breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Uh, if my children were looking at me and all they ever saw was sadness, I was reflecting on what would that mean for them? How would they turn out? So my job was to be happy. And we still, even when I was growing up after my brother's death, we still celebrate the milestones. We had graduations, we had birthdays, we had weddings. I come from a huge family. My mom's uh, family, 15 siblings and my father's 14 siblings. Wow. And our place was the center of activity for all of this. So and my first cousins were my best friends. So you're talking about a family that was really close knit and the suicide for my 
mother affected all of her siblings. And then for my father affected all of his siblings. And then together, the 29, they affected everyone. So I remember having to be the strong one. And even when it came time to making the preparations for the funerals, technically Catholics did not allow people who had died by suicide to have services, but it was a unique situation because that was the church I had grown up in. That's where my parents were so active. So both of their services were held, held there. And just having the responsibility of going to look for a casket, making sure we had the burial plot, all of those mechanics that you need in order to make sure that you're getting to this point where people are gathered and preparing for that casket to be lifted down into the ground. You know, it's on that special uh, machine with the rollers. I just remember afterwards that I was in a state of disbelief almost. Mm -hmm. that they both were gone. It's almost numbness. Yeah, it was numbness. And it was also because they would call all the time. And their reason, their rationale was, oh, we just want to check on Jonathan and Faith. We want to see how they're doing. We're going to send them something or we're going to send you, uh, uh, you know, open an account over here at Sears so that you can go and buy Jonathan's school clothes. They were so involved in their grandchildren's lives. So the, the, my children were missing that part of it. And I was missing that part of it. Um, my father and I, my, my father loved a good debate and he just would, he loved talking politics. He, 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 he just was, we used to call him like a prophet because he was just so into community development and he, we would talk about different things about this country and different states and cities. Mm -hmm. And like I said, my mother, she, you know, she was an incredible cook. So I just remember the times when I'd be talking to her and she would say, well, the next time you guys are here in Chicago, I decided mm -hmm. I'm going to make X, Y, and Z. So she would have these plans and she'd be kind of luring you in. Yeah. So, and this was happening while, uh, <clears throat> at the time or very close to the time when they died. So you, yeah. you, were there any signs? You said that one, I almost knew, but not your mom, right? I knew my mother was unhappy in her marriage, but that wasn't the first time she'd ever been unhappy. So I kind of took it for granted that, oh, they're just having another episode of like anyone's marriage sometimes of marital blues kind of thing i honestly cannot say that i was prepared for her mm -hmm. suicide there i mean looking back on it there were some conversations that we had where she was really upset about different things and i was the oldest so we almost tended to be confiding in each other and um i knew that she and my father, they were each other's really their first loves. They had this incredible love story and I was the result of it. So I always knew that even though she was upset, she would still be married. Then with my father, there was something inside of me because of his behavior during the week. And he was, you could literally see him going inside of himself. Mm -hmm. So it was hard for me to leave because I knew that there was a chance just because of the probability but I had to get back to my kids. Of course, yeah. And it, sound, it sounds like you went into maybe not business mode, but you, you, you had to take care of your kids. So you went into, you were the, the one who had to be strong. And, and we know that that has a toll. Was there a point yeah. in your life that you felt, okay, now I can grieve? Or do you, do you find that that kind of, postpone your grief? What, was it maybe a way that you found that, okay, I can't deal with my grief right now because it's way too much. So let's, let me focus on these things and then slowly go back to your own path. Well, there's something about the number seven because on the seventh anniversary of their deaths, that was the first relapse I had that was directly connected to grieving. And the only people who really could understand, because they were trying to explain it to the doctors, was my family. That was it. And so being in part of this huge family, and now they're trying to make sense of what I'm doing. Why did you, why is Joanna trying to die by suicide? There was a lot of pressure to get better because mm. I had the support 
Um, and I think that that seventh year when, when that relapse happened and for the first time I went, I had both of their uh, funeral uh, books where there's all the cards and everything were there. And I remember looked, opening up the, the, the book and seeing the date they were born and the date they died. And I was just like in a fog. Did yeah. this really happen kind of thing? And of course I knew that it happened. So sometimes I would deal with my grief by looking at pictures or listening to music, my mother's favorite music in particular. So for me, grief has just been ongoing. It shows up in different ways. And mm -hmm. over this last year, last November of 2020, I told my, my I call them my grown folks. I said, listen, Jonathan and Faith, this year I'm going to write down in my planner, the date that mama died, the date that she was buried, the date that daddy died, and the date that he was buried. That was my first time writing that out to wow. where it would come up on my calendar and I would say, oh, this is the date. That they, and I get emotional now because I'm able to tell this story without so much emotion. Now that's how I can kind of say I'm getting better because I'm not falling apart during the whole interview. But um, that was my first time this past year saying, you know what, I've got to keep start dealing with this. And honestly, it was also because I found I was going to have a grandchild. And I'm saying to myself, I got to be in better wow. shape here. So my healing is coming about because of some milestones and my, both my children attended pretty prestigious schools, just like I did. So when they graduated, I'm saying to them, oh, your grandparents would be so proud of you. Just always keeping them front and center that even though they weren't physically here, mm -hmm. they were to be remembered. And in African culture, we have libations to the ancestors. So even at my son's wedding, we had a part of it where we did the libations for his grandparents to make sure that they were brought into the presence of everyone there. Mm -hmm. And we were asking for their blessings as he moved forward on his journey and his marriage, which was also another unique situation because my son's wife is from Bangladesh mm -hmm. and they have these two very unique cultures. His biological father's from the Congo. And I talk about this because I'm coming to a greater understanding of just how much we're all really uh, a part of each other in our own way, even though we're from different parts of the world. Uh-huh. Well, Joanna, you, you talked about how they would be proud of your son, and I'm sure they're so proud of you too. Thank and I'm you. Glad, and I'm glad that you are now writing about this, you are talking about this, because that's part of healing. Mm -hmm. And I feel so honored to have you here with us. Thank you for, thank you for coming, for saying yes to the interview, for sharing, and for being open, you know, to just to end this interview, because I, I want to, I want my listeners to always be helped and have some kind of skills. And I always ask mm -hmm. this to, to those who struggle with mental illness, with suicidal ideation, what has helped you that could help my listener? The main thing is to remember that there's always faith, hope, and love. Those are the three primary ingredients. I believe that's the elixir in the world that we can somehow find that faith, hope, and love. We need more people to talk about it this way so that people will understand that if nothing else, I am loved. That's my reason for sticking around because I get emotional here though, <laughs> because someone, I like I could see my two children, they love me. I could see mm -hmm. over here, they love me. This person that cares. So I think that as human beings, we need to be more protective of our well-being. We need to be more protective of our self-care and make sure that we're surrounding ourselves with positive energy, because that is, a, that is part of healing. That, ability to be able to bring people into your life or make sure the people in your life are more positive than negative. You'll learn a lot more from that process and you'll also be able to give and take because you know, some of the people who have been hurt the most, they're the most giving people. Yeah, because so, they know they know the right, need, right? 
so it's also a part of for as much as you give be be able to take that back be able to accept what people are giving to you and for my own journey what has been most instrumental especially over the past three years because i've paid greater attention to it is when there's something negative happening in my life whether it's for me or for someone else i let those feelings in and then i convert them to positive energy and invariably every single time i do that when i say, okay, these are these negative feelings and I, I wanna be over here instead, something positive of even greater magnitude comes in. It could be a person, it could be an experience, it could be a resource, but it's just been tried and true for me. And the other thing I would like to say is that when I was got into my fifties, I remember, cause I say praying is talking to God and meditating is listening to God. And I remember that I said, I said, God, you know, I'm just going to take my hands off the steering wheel. I'm going to get out of the way. I'm going to get out of the back seat. I'm getting out of the way. And immediately I felt this pressure that I didn't even know was there. Leave me. Wow. So that's the other part of it is to trust the process, to know that you don't have to be in control all the time, to understand that there's a higher power that's at work here that has unconditional love for you and that wants you to be doing well in life so that's really what i would add and thank you for the opportunity because i got a chance to look at your podcast and your blog and your all your <laughs> other resources and you're just doing incredible work and i feel so blessed to also be connected to you now paula so oh, thank, thank you thank you joanna thank you for your words and i hope i'm sure this has been so helpful and so healing for my listeners and I hope that you get, you know, Joanna was telling me before I started recording that she is now trying to get to Australia to see her first grandson, right? Yes, thank you. So well, I child. hope I you do. Thanks yet. <laughs> I don't, yeah, but yes, the, you know, it might take a little bit longer, but I think I also told you my son had promised me a baby cam. So that'll have to be well, the next thing. Well, so. just, just make sure you do whenever you yes. can, as soon as you can, because as you said, nothing is more important than love, right? right? That's the most healing aspects of our lives. And yes. there you are, you're going to look at this baby and love is going to expand in your life. Right, so, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for being here and thank you for accepting my invitation. You're welcome. Thank you. Oh.